Okay, Jen, um, looks like our uh, participant count stabilized. So, and we're, the live stream is live. So go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so welcome. So I'm just gonna continue. Oh, Matt, sorry, you're on the admitting thing. Okay, good. Um, so welcome uh, everyone here today, um, this talk uh, by Maria. Uh, so, this is uh, a talk as part of a series of talks we're giving as part of AFO Cafe, um, which being here you're all familiar with. And so AFO Cafe is very much about informal science con con conversations about all things birds. Uh, and so this is hosted by the Association of Field Ornithologists, otherwise AFO. So you're, uh, as a quick note, it's uh, you're probably noticing um, by the dates that it's our centenary year uh, and we'll get on a little bit more about uh, a meeting we're hosting to celebrate that in a minute. So as AFO, we're focused on the study and conservation of birds and their natural habitats. Um, we have a nice bridge between professional ornithologists and amateur ornithologists, and we have a strong focus on Latin America. So specifically with outreach, scientific meetings, and also grant programs focused on folk um, doing research in Latin America. Um, so visit our website to learn more about those things. So going on to our centenary year, we have a really exciting meeting lined up um, for the 10th to the 13th of October. Uh, so in a couple of months time, right, which is kind of uh, pretty close. Uh, and that's gonna be held in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And so we've got lots of offer at that meeting, which I'll come to uh, in a minute. Um, the early bird registration is uh, close on the 31st. So if you're interested in going to that meeting, please check out the website and register by Sunday if you want to get early bird registration. And so as part of that meeting, we've got four uh, excellent plenary speakers uh, on each day of that conference. So Dr. John Critcher, Scott Widensall, uh, Dr. Lee Emily Choi, uh, and then Dr. Catherine Parsons. We also have uh, numerous workshops lined up and you can go to the uh, conference website and learn more about those. Uh, we also uh, have numerous um, uh, field trips and things like that, in addition to these workshops, which are outlined here. So specifically, the two workshops are an introduction to passerine uh, banding and then one focused on educational outreach in field ornithology. And as I said a minute ago, the deadline for early registration is July 31st. So have a look at the website, have a look at what we're doing, some of the different symposia, etc. And uh, yeah, get registered. And so kind of before we introduce um, Maria and her talk, I just wanted to let you know about the next AFO Cafe, which will be um, occurring on August 26th. So you can sign up for that on our website and then also we'll share uh, more details via social media. So have a look out on social media for more details. So that's going to be by Valeria uh, Hojedo, who's going to speak about cavity use in Patagonian uh, Nothofagus forests. Uh, and uh, a really uh, important mention to the sponsors of AFO Cafe, uh, Avinet Research Supplies, who are owned um, by AFO, managed by BRI. And, and so if you're interested and wanting to buy um, mist nets and field equipment for um, upcoming field seasons and also um, if you're working on bats too, we have a, an excellent assortment of different things that you might need for uh, to support those field-based um, research projects. So have a look at our website listed um, below for all of your needs for field work. And so if you enjoy 
our AFO Science Cafe today or you've enjoyed other ones, we really encourage you to become a member of AFO. Uh, there's lots of benefits um, for this. You're supporting uh, continuous running of AFO Cafe. You're supporting our grant programs. You're supporting annual meetings and all the things that we do for student and early professionals, uh, also uh, d &I initiatives. And also you can get discounts on our research supplies at Albanet. So if you're interested in becoming a member, uh, please check out our website uh, and we encourage you to, to do that. All right, so moving on to today's main focus, which we're really excited about. So really uh, excited to have uh, Maria here today, who's going to give a talk um, about a radiation of avian hema, um, sparatone parasites. Um, I'm really excited that there's going to be some talk of grackles here. Uh, if um, some of you know me, I'm at UTSA uh, San Antonio, and we have so many grackles on the campus, and I'm always like, I know nothing about them really and i'm really excited to like hear a little bit about kind of some of their ecology in relation to parasites so i'm super excited about this so just to kind of um introduce uh, maria a little bit more so maria did her equivalent of her undergraduate uh in and I'm, maria i am absolutely sorry if i murder this name um but the universidad simon uh, bolivia and then she also did her phd at the same institute and she is currently, and since 2005, been an assistant professor uh, of research at Temple University in Philadelphia. So uh, she also serves uh, in numerous roles from the Neotropical Ornithological uh, Society. So specifically, uh, she's in the middle of her term for vice president, which she will become the president elect, which we're really excited about in 2023 to 2027. Uh, so um, for all of you uh, who are interested, uh, we have a, a joint meeting um, with numerous other societies uh, down in Bolivia next year. So uh, look out for more, more news about that. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, I'll let Maria take it away. And I can stop sharing. So thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you. Thank you for uh, staying with me today in a Friday afternoon that everybody is a little bit tired. And um, I am very happy to present our result about uh, the radiation of avian hemosporidium parasite. And in my talk, I really want to give a brief uh, background or introduction about the parasite. I don't want to bother you with too much with this. And um, then I will explain the three current projects that we are developing in our lab. So the first one is the Greg Tell Grackle as a model to understand how a host gregarious behavior and geographic expansion may affect the local parasite community and the biographic pattern of this parasite. And the second one is uh, use Raptor as a model to understand hemosporidian parasite diversity in non-passeriform. The reason is because uh, non-passeriform are the group that have less information about their parasite. Um, and then I will finalize talking about our long term project that is time the radiation of hemoparasite. So let's start uh, talking about the parasite inside. So the order Aemosporida, uh, Filuna picomplexa, is a very, very diverse group of monophyletic group of vector-borne hemoparasite that include, of course, the species of medical importance, such as Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, that are the agent of the human malaria. Uh, malaria is a disease. So the species that produce this disease belong to the genus Plasmodium. However, there are several uh, genus or genera that we will show you in a few minutes. Um, the life cycle of this particular group of parasites is really complex. 
So what I will do is show in this figure a cartoon of the cycle. So this involves a blood feeding dictera vector and a vertebrate host. Uh, in the vector occur the sexual reproduction and in the uh, vertebrate host occur this asexual multiplication. There are many stages, morphological stages of the parasite, but essentially two are infected. One are the sporozoite, that are the, the state that the dictera uh, transmit to the vertebrate host when by the host. And then they take from them the gametocytes, uh, female and male. And the gametogenesis occur inside the dictera. Of course, there are many details because uh, that I cannot take the time to explain here because we have different uh, families of dictera and we have different uh, vertebrate hosts. So four families has been recognized in this order. And as you can see in this figure, leucocytosome, hemoproteus, uh, subgenus, hemoproteus, and parhemoproteus, and plasmodium are present in birds. As you can see also each uh, different uh, genera uh, is transmitted by a different antitera. Uh, in addition to this uh, genera that are the most common and the most, uh, is, you will find um, many, many studies, uh, studios uh, about this. We have the genus Aemocystidium falicia and garnia, present in reptiles, nycteria and polychromophilus in bats, and hepatocystid in bats and macaques. Although these parasitic protozoa are found in many vertebrate hosts, as you can see, uh, most species has been described in birds. So I hope I convince you today that this particular group of vertebrae are very important and a key to understand the evolution of this parasite. More than 160 species has been described in birth. Um, people describe the species using uh, traditionally microscopy, uh, describing all the stages, okay? But after 1998, when the first sequence of cytochrome B, parasite cytochrome B was published, um, people start to combine the microscopy with molecular to essentially PCR in order to uh, develop many uh, projects in phylogenetic and ecological studies. Uh, those studies uh, uh, in the last 10 years, there are a thousand, uh, and generated more than 4,000 uh, parasite lineage, um, about a small fragment of the cytochrome and those are found in more than around, I will say, 2,000 uh, bird, bird species that belong to almost all clades. Uh, you can find those sequence in GeneBank and also in Malawi database that was a database developed for bench and collaborators in 2009. And it has been a very uh, successful database that people use in order to uh, develop uh, ecological studies. Um, however, the fragment that uh, they use is a very small fragment that you can see here. This is a representation of the mitochondrial genome, but have no enough, enough informative size in order to uh, solve a big phylogenetic tree. And we are really interested in our lab in to study the evolution of the order. So for that reason, in our lab, we have been developed uh, two protocols. Uh, one is to amplify the complete cytochrome B, and that could be using a primary uh, PCR. But if you have very low parasitemia that is very common in some species of bird, uh, you can do an este PCR and get almost uh, complete uh, cytochrome, cytochrome. And the other protocol is uh, to amplify the almost the complete genome. 
because that allow us to have more informative side when we are using all genera in order to estimate the phylogenetic relationship between them and study the origin of the group. Um, I like to say that this uh, mitochondrial genome is very interesting because it's the smaller one in the eukaryotes. Uh, it's only 6KB and only have three genes. Um, the small and large subunits are fragmented across the genome. And that has been conserved across all the species so far that we have been studied. Um, using this protocol, uh, we have developed several projects in our lab. Most of them has been in primate, but because my background is in ornithology, I started to work with uh, bird um, 10 years ago, uh, uh, looking for this parasite. So the three projects that I will uh, talk about it uh, is using those methods. The first one, as I said, will be the Great Tail Grackle. Okay, this is a, a small project inside the Grackle project, coordinated by Corina Logan uh, from Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. This study has been done uh, in Arizona and California. Um, today, I will talk about the result from Arizona because we already finished and submit the paper to plus one, um, we are waiting for the final decision. Uh, and then we will start to work with the sample from California that we are uh, almost done with the field three. So Grackel, as you know, are social and polygonous species. Uh, and their population has been rapidly expanded across America over the past century. And it was first reported in Arizona in 1935. And then they were nesting around 1936, 37, before the agriculture boom in Sonora. So in Arizona, uh, we cut uh, 87 grackles in the wild, uh, close to uh, um, uh, Arizona State University in Tempe, from January 2018 2000, uh, to February 2020. Um, for those 87 grackle, we take blood sample in order to do blood smear and see, uh, describe the species and identify the species. And also we did the molecular uh, diagnostic using the protocol that I explained. So the first result was that the prevalence of hemoporida was very high, was around 62%. Um, where plasmodium, in, the genus plasmodium was the more frequent in that population, around 60.9%. And only one individual was infected with hemoproteus. So when we look at the blood smear, we found gametocytes that are the key to know is this um, vertebrae host, this bird, is a competent host or not. And essentially we found uh, those gametocytes for several of the plasmodiolinas that we found in the population. So essentially for plasmodium falciparo, uh, uh, sorry, for plasmodium, we found uh, six linas. Uh, three of them correspond to morpho species. One is plasmodium catemerum, the other is plasmodium homopolare, and the other is plasmodium relictum. That, uh, many people know the problem with plasmodium relictum in Hawaii. In this case, uh, any of the birds uh, have sign of disease and only four were positive. Mm -hmm. And the linus was the one that is more common in North America. Essentially, catemerum and homopolare are the ones that are in high prevalence. And as you see, uh, most of the sequence that has been published in Malawi database or in GeneBank uh, has been reported only in North America. And those linas that were found in very, very low uh, frequency uh, can be found in South America and in another uh, continents. Uh, here we have the only linas that we found in, in for hemoproteus and is 
most of the time is present in North America too. Interesting, we didn't find uh, linas that were only specific for these uh, species. Actually, they can infect many resident and migratory birds. And as you can see for the colors in, in the map, and essentially has been also reported in other birds in Arizona. When we did the analysis uh, using the sequence and estimate the phylogenetic tree in order to understand the relation between the parasite that we are finding in this population, we found essentially that we have a species from each particular clay that conform the genus Plasmodium. Um, in green, you can see a sequence that has been reported also in Mexico and in red or in Texas. In the case of Hemoproteus, we have only one linus, as I said before, and was exactly the same that has been reported in Texas. Um, I need to say now that in, when we were working in this project, uh, the first formal population study of Hemosporidium gracchel was published at that moment and was done in Texas. So most of the information that we have is only for Texas. And we have a couple of sequence that has been reported recently for Mexico, but no formal study. So this opened the possibility to, to study this bird in other states and other countries, because we don't know exactly what is going on in South America, for example. Um, so when we uh, compare our result against uh, those found in Texas was totally the opposite. And for us was, what, what is going on here? So most of the, uh, the birds were infected with hemoproteus instead of plasmodium. And only one individual was uh, infected with plasmodium catenary, the same linas that has been found in Arizona. So we are starting to see uh, what could be the reason of that. Um, well, Arizona is very dry and all the grackel are always around the lakes and pound. And we know that they are in Arizona and everywhere there is a lake. And those are the perfect places for um, the vector that transmit a plasmodium that is uh, so are species from genus Culex. So we believe that microclimatic condition, vegetation, and difference in bird behavior may explain the difference between the population from Texas and Arizona. Actually, they in Texas, they test the vectors and they found a high prevalence of them in produce instead of plasmodium. Um, so the difference may relate to land use and the environmental requirement of each specific vector, determining the local high prevalence uh, on one parasite over another. We hypothesize the Dracula as, as a species that is expanding uh, his geographic range is affecting the local parasite community as a new susceptible host that change the transmission of the local parasite rather than introduce uh, parasite from other places. Um, for that, our data is suggesting that grackle are a highly susceptible uh, because we have very high prevalence and chronically infected hosts because we have very low parasitemia, was hard to find the stages in the blood smear, so that indicate low parasitemia, and without any sign of disease in this case, for any of the birds that we cut. Uh, so those characteristics are consistent with parasite tolerance. So Grackel could be competent reservoirs, able to transmit atmosporidian lineas to other species of birds that are around. Indeed, we found that um, the two most common uh, year-round and with the spread uh, birds like house sparrow uh, and house finches also uh, can have those linas that we are found in crack. So the dynamic of the multiple hosts remain unknown. 
and we believe this is a perfect model to understand the effect of the host competence in a community context. Uh, indeed, uh, we have another evidence that uh, this, those species are circulating because when we compare our sequence from Grackel again, what we found uh, before in California condor, we found exactly the same lineage. So transmission is actually occurring between different species of bird in Arizona. When we start, uh, we did this analysis with uh, California condor that we analyzed a sample from 10 years, and we start to do our analysis of what we got uh, with this species, we found that there is very little information in North America about raptors. And most of the work were done in California and the West Coast in general. Of course, there are few uh, sequences that you can find in other states of the country, but essentially most of the work that has been done in raptors has been done in Europe or Asia. So that is the reason because oh, today I would like uh, I, I want to uh, show you our preliminary data about Raptor as a model to understand the Mosporidium parasite diversity in this particular group of non Um Essentially, this is a pilot project uh, because it's, it's, as you know, it's very hard to work and get many samples for Raptor because it's hard to to cut and all the permits, etc. But essentially, we are interested in this particular group uh, because also Raptor provides essential ecosystem service. And we don't know exactly the pool of parasites that are infecting this particular group. And um, what we know in birds is when some species of parasite could be very pathogenic and sometimes there are no pathogenic, but if the bird is under stress, like lead poison, chemical, like the case of raptors, then the system immune is depressed and those parasites could be a real problem for them, as we will see later when I start to talk about one of the linas that we found. So we really want to understand the factor and process affecting the raptor population, because it's not only a health uh, one health priority, but also uh, have important economic impact. So for, for this project, we start to uh, contact people from uh, rescue centers. And um, thanks to Erica Miller, that was the person that uh, first opened the, the door for us and, and was very excited to give us sample and discuss and, and because she was doing also um, blood smear, and she was really concerned about what is happening with raptors in general. Uh, she started to send us sample, and also in collaboration with Nora Matthews, Scott Beckerman, and Mitch Oswald from the Wildlife Service, we started to pull a group of samples of 60, 52 in total. Of course, this is no a real population study because we don't have too many samples from a specific play for a specific uh, species, but we have to explore what is going on with this group. What we found is that um, uh, and those samples are from different states, uh, most of them from the East Coast, because we also want to compare what is happening in California. Uh, what we found at the beginning was that we have 163 uh, positive, uh, with 17 leucocytosome, 9 hemoproteus, and A plasmodial lineage. So that is a very diverse group of parasites in this particular group of birds. And if you see, we have, we found plasmodium, we found hemoproteus, and also leucocytosome with a, with a good number of uh, species. Uh, I want to highlight that and there are two to four species that are very interesting to focus. One are the owls. Um, the gray horned owl essentially have a very high prevalence of one hemoproteus that I will talk later, which one is. 
And the other one uh, is the red tail hawk because we have a good number. And we found a lot of uh, plasmodium, hemoproteus, and leucocytosome species. Uh, Boligal, interesting, have also uh, several species of leucocytosome and plasmodium. And almost you cannot find anything in Boligals. Whatever you find was uh, describing morphology long time ago, but there is nothing published yet. So everything that we found could be a new species or a new lineage that we really want to continue to explore. Um, so what I did was now that I have the sequence, I want to see what is the relationship between them and compare which species of bear have which uh, uh, a specific parasite, and I estimate three phylogenetic tree because we have a lot of data. So one is for the genus leuco uh, leucocytosome, another for hemoproteus, and another for plasmodium. And now I, I will explain each of those. Uh, regarding leucocytosome, we found, as you can see in blue, those all are the lineage that we are founding in these 600 samples. Um, it's amazing the diversity that we are finding because there was no one lineage, it's 70 lineage. And in red, you can see the new lineage that has not been published before or in Malawi or uh, Jimbang. So we are excited to Continue with this, but unfortunately, we don't have blood smear for all those linas, so we cannot describe them as a uh, species level. So that opened the possibility to write new project in order to study particular species in more deep. Um, in light yellow is uh, labeled uh, what people that do morphology, I, I, I am not doing morphology by myself. Uh, I am more a molecular person. Um, uh, they call this uh, group as a toddy because it's very hard using morphology to separate the species. And several of the species that has been found in California can be uh, found at the base of the tree. So we are finding new things when we compare against California. Um, in the case of uh, hemoproteus, parhemoproteus, we have, we found nine lineage. Uh, also, you can see that are spread across the, the tree. And essentially, uh, we have found in Merlin, we found hemoproteus catartis that has been um, uh, found before and described only in Turkey Volter. Uh, that species is specific for, for this um, species of spur. And in the case of uh, our, we found three different lineage of hemoproteus. One is new, and the other is, and was the most prevalent one, is very close to hemoproteus here. So this uh, parasite is considered very pathogenic in Europe and has been described before in Europe but nobody has been uh, identified here in the state. So what we did was go to the databases, get all the sequence that has been published in ours and do an aplotide network no? using the cytochrome B sequence, the small one, the 400, that is what we have available. And in blue, are those that has been uh, re uh, recognized as a hemoproteus serum. And in the other color, the one that have uh, described as at the level of species. And in gray are only the linas that nobody know which species is. So when I saw this aprotein neighbor say, what is all of the blue has to be the same species should be together, but no, are spread a, a, across the aplotide network. So I decide to do an aplotide network only with these that are considered hemoproteus cirni. And what I found again is 
uh, that this particular lineage is, has been uh, published before in several states of the United States, but nobody knows the species, of course. Um, doing this analysis, I found that this the lineage that is closer than, uh, uh, to this one, that is the one that was used to describe the species. So we are now with Dr. Valkyuna, that is the expert in morphology, to see if this is um, really a uh, hemoproteus cirri or is a different species, um, but is close related to cirri. So using morphology is complicated and um, trying to describe the species, you need to have several individuals with the same parasite and compare all the stages uh, before the state, sure, yes, this is could be an, an species, a kid, a name. Uh, so we are now in the process to decide if this lineage is Sirni or not. But what is uh, uh, true is that most of the hours uh, when they uh, got in the rescue center, they were in very bad condition. So that is consistent with what has been published uh, in Europe that Sirni is really pathogenic in owls. Um, so this opened the possibility to continuing uh, studying this particular group. Uh, regarding Plasmodium, uh, again, we have several lineage and we have a new lineage here in Osprey and another lineage here uh, in Osprey too that I would like you to explain why I am interested in that particular one. So when I compare the sequence, uh, that one uh, is identical to a one that has been reported in good stork in Brazil and in vaccine uh, from Venezuela from Oz. So this is really cool result because that opened the possibility to study the osprey even that is a migratory reactor, uh, to understand the pattern of parasite migration when uh, we study this at, at the level of the community level. So um, with this part, I want to uh, summarize that it's important to see uh, this uh, group of parasite together with the vectors and the host and see everything at the, le at the community level, because that is the way that we can explain better what is going on with this group of parasites. So let me finish with the last project. Uh, this project is a long-term project. We have been working for more than 14 years because we require a lot of samples and a lot of good sequence in order to estimate a good phylogen phylogeny that allow us to estimate a tantu. So let me first explain uh, the consideration that uh, when people uh, work with timing uh, need to take in account. First is the types of sample. You have to have a very good number of uh, sample that you know cover all the genera that you can include in a, a phylogenetic tree because that impact the topology and also the branch length of the, each particular species. Uh, and then when you have a good sample, or well, at least never is, is perfect, but a good number, uh, you have to um, estimate the phylogenetic tree using different methods, Bayesian and maximum likelihood, uh, at least, in order to have an idea how robust is your phylogeny. And when your phylogeny is robust, then you can start to think, okay, let me uh, estimate the time. For that, um, there are different methods to, for dating. And we prefer to use a relaxed method because in that way we allow um, the rate, the molecular rate vary among the species. Uh, instead of to use a, a strict clock method, because that uh, you are uh, assuming that this is a, a constant rate of evolution that is not the case. 
Um, then the calibrations. Uh, calibration is very tricky and is a key to have good calibration uh, in order to get a really good uh, or decent uh, time tree. Uh, in this case, it's uh, critical for us because we don't have any particular fossil uh, for a parasite that we can use as a calibration constraint. Uh, so we have to use or paleontological or geographic information about the host. That is what people call a secondary calibration. And the idea is uh, that when you use secondary calibration, you already have several sources of uncertainty. So you have to, uh, in order to uh, get better results, you have to have many calibration points across the pathology. Then um, there are different methods uh, that you can uh, use uh, to, uh, if you want to uh, have um, uh, independent and identical uh, rate distributed uh, across the tree that is called incorrelated uh, relaxed clock, or if you want to uh, uh, relay with, uh, has relation between the neighbor branches. That is what we call autocorrelated relaxed clock. We prefer to use both methods uh, because it's, the both methods are consistent, so your data is more robust. So we decide for this uh, project, um, always we try to use what and compare the result. Then the priors in order to calibrate the divergence. So there are four different uh, priors that you can use, but we prefer to use the uniform because in that way we don't have preference to any particular uh, time when we give a range uh, as a calibration. Um, so now let me show you the first result that was the phylogeny. Uh, let me explain the calibrations first. Um, as you can see, uh, and I say before, we don't have uh, a good uh, fossil for parasite. However, there is a Plasmodium dominica that was found in uh, Dominican um, uh, Dominicana amber. Amber, it, but the problem is that um, the date of that amber is not clear, so we cannot use it because it's it's, it's no accurate. Um, what happened is uh, this plasmodium uh, is very similar to plasmodium justa nuclearis that is found in uh, chicken, in poultry in general. So it's close to uh, the bird parasite, but unfortunately we cannot use it. Instead of that, we have three possibilities and we are trying to inc uh, increase the possibility for other calibration constraints. We are now in the process to find a couple of more. But the one that we are using constantly and we haven't tested uh, uh, several times are those three that are here. Two are fossil-based uh, calibration. There are one has to be related with uh, the diverging between Papio and macaques. And the other one is uh, the time that include the split between human and macaques. And the third is a biographical event, that is when the, uh, the, the lemur radiate to Madagascar. Uh, that event happened between uh, 16 million years ago to 20. So we are using those uh, calibration points because we have a sequence for those particular groups. So now I will show you the phylogeny that we obtained for more than 100 mitochondrial genomes, no cytochrome B. Um, and in blue, uh, we have plasmodium, gen uh, the genus plasmodium. These uh, clay are the species that you can find in, in mammals. And this one is uh, the plasmodium that has been found in reptiles, the, the light blue, and in birds. In red, we have uh, paremoproteus that uh, also uh, share a common ancestor with a, 
uh, one species of leucocytosome called Cauyeri. And then we have Hemoproteus hemoproteus. We don't have too many species described for this particular uh, genus. And then we have leucocytosome um, here. As you can see, for the moment that we developed this study, we didn't have that many leucocytosome uh, that now we can have um, from the raptors. So raptor is a good group to increase the number of uh, sequence in order to have a, a better idea about the relation between that. So the field results, when we saw the phylogeny using multiple methods, Bayesian and maximum likelihood was that most of the nodes were well solved. Um, and then the uh, AT content across the species was very similar, something that is a problem in the case of uh, use nuclear gene in this parasite, because this particular clay here the, the species that are related to plasmodium vivas, the human parasite, have a high uh, GC content. And when you do phylogeny, you need to be sure uh, the substitution model that you are using to estimate the phylogeny uh, correspond to a divergence between the AT content. So normally it's better to have uh, a similar AT content across the species in order to estimate a phylogeny. Uh, so this indicate that uh, the mitochondrial genome is a good marker to estimate phylogeny. And also is, mm, we don't find evidence that was saturated. So have enough uh, informative sites that allow us to solve the relationship between different genera. Um, However, it's interesting because if you see carefully here, we have hepatocystis uh, that clay with uh, plasmodium. And then we have here leucocytosome cauteri that clay with parahemoproteus. So that indicate that these uh, hemosporidia genera are paraphyletic. And this is a result that was published long time ago with a small piece of cytochrome B and we are corroborating that with more sequence, um, more genera. Um, then another result was that each clay uh, was associated with, a diff with the vector. And also that also was published before, uh, suggesting that that could be a possibility and our data corroborate that. Um, unfortunately, in this tree, we don't have nicteria, polychromophilus, or hemocysteine. And we are in the process to include these two. Uh, recently, we have a colleague that is uh, helping us with that. And um, last year, we included hemocysterium and prepid analysis, and we are happy to say that the topology is consistent. In addition, this topology is uh, very consistent with one that has been uh, published in 2018 by Spencer and collaborator using nuclear genes. Um, and we are happy that both phylogeny are very consistent. So um, now that we have the tree and we are happy with the tree, we uh, pick the, the calibration point that I explained before. And I want to show you where exactly they uh, goes. And essentially, if you see, all the calibration are in the mammal clay. And that is a problem. We need uh, to find uh, other calibration that could be used in other parts of the tree. Unfortunately, because birds are migratory, uh, it's hard to find a good uh, calibration point. Um, lizard could be an, an option uh, because they move less and has to be related with probably and endemic lizard in an island or something like that in order to find another uh, calibration for this part of the tree. Um, as you can see, uh, there is no monophyletic group uh, for uh, reptile. It's, it's inside the plasmodium that you can find in birds. Uh, after that, we decide to study the, uh, to estimate the time tree. And here I present a cartoon 
of the time tree, uh, you can uh, check uh, our paper because we have many, uh, uh, several time tree there comparing all the methods that we use. And essentially this one is the, uh, the one that represents the, the best result that we got. Uh, in green, you have leucocytosome. Here you have uh, hemoproteus, hemoproteus, uh, caugeri, and then hemoproteus, parhemoproteus, uh, plasmodium that infect ungulate, uh, plasmodium that infect uh, reptiles and birds, and then mammals um, in general. So, and all three calibrations, as you can see, are here. Surprisingly, the time that we got for the origin um, overlap uh, with the origin of paleognatite birth. That was a really cool result. Um, and I am happy to say that we are repeating this analysis with the pathocysty and we exact, uh, uh, found exactly the same uh, time uh, that overlap here. Uh, so we are happy to suggest or propose that uh, hemosporidia parasite diversify during the radiation of the vertebrae host. And as you can see, the diversification of the parasite is also occurring after the KT uh, extension event and is also happening with the diversification of the bird. Um, then we estimate the rate of evolution uh, of per branch uh, in this tree um, using a method that is called real time that is available in the program MEGA that people use uh, to analyze a sequence, a DNA, a DNA sequence. And essentially what we found is that there is a, um, you can see in, in purple, uh, you have the lower rates and in red, the highest rate. So mammals have the highest rate of evolution when you compare against the other groups. Mm, one possibility is because has been a big uh, explosive uh, species plasmodium uh, radiation in uh, macaques and mammals in general. So we believe that is the reason because we are uh, getting this result. Uh, Paremoproteus is the group that is have the lowest um, rate of evolution, okay? However, if you see carefully in this tree, uh, the last group that we have here is uh, Hemoproteus and Hemoproteus, and we don't have in that tree uh, leucocytosome. And the reason is because leucocytosome is used as an group for the analysis and the rates in that particular group are not uh, relevant. So our idea now is less uh, increase the number of leucocytosome species and Raptor is a uh, good uh, um, group of species that we can use in order to reconstruct a bigger phylogeny Reestimate the times and also the rate of evolution and see um, and compare the result and see what is happening with genus leucocytos leucocytosome. So finally, um, uh, I want to summarize that possible the radiation of the major parasite is occurring during the radiation of the vertebrae host, no the uh, vector because vector uh, originate between 100 to 200 million years ago. So it's not possible to complete the life cycle if you don't have the host, so the vertebrae host. So we have to see the radiation of this parasite as a result of the uh, community evolutionary process between the vertebrate and the invertebrate uh, host. So we hypothesize that uh, the, probably the group of uh, invertebrate uh, that are the vectors and the vertebrate uh, start to interact during the evolution, providing diverse um, biocenosis uh, where hemophoridian parasite start to radiate. Uh, for those that are interested in this topic, 
uh, in addition to what we use as a Bible to identify uh, the species, uh, recently was published this book about avian malaria and related parasite in the tropics in 2020 by Diego Santiago Larcón and Alfonso Marsal. And this is a very good summary of what has been done in the last 20 years and that is a lot. It's, uh, it's a really good uh, summary that I really recommend to read. And if you are interested in speciation, uh, we have a charter there about cophylogenetic pattern and speciation in avian and osporidium parasite. With that, I really want to thank to all our colleagues that has been the key of this project because they have been working with us hard to find those species that we are missing all the time to uh, uh, have the puzzle complete. And also the people that is now helping us with tractors uh, this is a project that is difficult to, to, to do for many reasons, but with this group of samples, we, we have uh, now the possibility to uh, write projects and, and trying to look for, for funding for that. With that, thank you so much, all of you that are here listening to me, and I'm happy to take any question. And if anyone want to contact me, um, this is my email address. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maria. I want to first apologize. I had some huge computer issues when I was doing your uh, introduction. So sorry if it wasn't uh, polished as much. My whole screen was frozen, so it was really hard to <laughs> do anything. But um, sorry about that, but thank you so much. So we're going to take questions uh, from the floor. Um, you can either put them in the uh, chat box or yeah, raise your hand if you have a question. And thank you so much, Maria, it's great talk. I've actually got a quick question myself. So it was super interesting that you saw high prevalence in uh, great horned owls. So um, I'm currently doing some work on great horned owls myself, not in this realm at all. Um, but my student and myself are looking at uh, prevalence and exposure of uh, great horned owls to rodenticide poisoning mm -hmm. in urban owls. And I noticed that you had really high prevalence of parasites in, in that species. And I was just wondering, like, as, as I was thinking about this, uh, is it, are there linkages with uh, rodenticide poisoning? Because we know that they're getting more urbanized and, um, it, well, two parts is prevalence or parasites higher in urban areas and are there linkages to rodenticide? Does anyone know those things? Uh, honestly, I don't think there is a clear pattern uh, how is the prevalence in different state. Uh, as I say, we don't have a population for mm -hmm. each particular uh, state. We have a couple of, uh, from the East Coast. Um, and the problem is um, most of the parasite uh, could be no pathogenic in general. Uh, mm -hmm. There are several that, yes, there are pathogenic like relictum sometimes, but most of the bird and also primate in general, no us, <laughs> that manage very well the possibility to have the parasite. So when you look at the, uh, the blood, they are healthy. There is no sign of disease. But when something happens, uh, they are exposed to chemicals or pesticide or lay poison and, and they are sick, then you see how the parasitemia start to be very high and then they die. So people, uh, the veterinarian that uh, we are working with, they believe it's a combination of things. But in the case of our, um, what uh, this veterinarian found is they are okay, they were not, you know, they, she didn't find chemicals, anything, but uh, they were very in bad condition. So she really believed that in the case of our, is the parasite that is producing the disease. Mm -hmm. So that is the reason because our are, are key to understand uh, how this parasite impact in the health of this group. 
right? But for example, uh, the California condor, they have Plasmodium homopolare, they were very perfect. Uh, we cut the same individual two, three years and was okay. And one day doesn't have any parasites. So it's interesting, they can manage very well the, the disease. But in case that one of them is, you know, under stress for uh, late poison or another chemical, then the parasite could be a real problem. That was the reason because we really trying to publish the paper because we have to be careful and, and continue to study because with this climate change, vectors are expanding and the, the diversity of vector and the abundance of the vector is changing. And with that, and if you have the host and the host is tolerant, uh, it's part of the transmission and, and then things can be complicated in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Yvonne McHugh in uh, the chat. Uh, Yvonne, I welcome you to, um, to unmute if you want and ask that, or I'm more than happy to read it out. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I, I love that talk. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, I'm particularly interested in Osprey, and I was wondering, first of all, if there's, if any of your publications have the details of the Osprey, infected Osprey that you mentioned, whether that's been published yet as far as specific locations in the Americas. Um, that was one question. Uh, I can go through all the questions or just answer them as I ask. I can answer that. Uh, okay. The answer is no. Uh, this is our very recent result. Uh, we haven't published that yet. Um, our idea probably is to write a general paper of, uh, talking about the diversity of the, the parasite that we found in this particular group of sample. Um, and then see and explore the possibility to, to have a, a, a solid project. But I haven't published that yet. Okay. Um, I was just thinking that the two osprey you found that one uh, might have gotten infected in Venezuela, one might have gotten infected in Brazil, if I understand that right? No, that no. Uh, one is a... Uh, um, a lineage uh, that has not been reported before. And the one that was in the top was only uh, one sequence, one lineage that we found in one individual. And when I compared that particular sequence uh, against what has been published before, it's only reported in Brazil and Venezuela, but not in Osprey, it's reported only, has been found only in the vaccine and the, and the store. So we believe the transmission occurred in South America when the osprey migrate to South America and went to those places where it can be very close to a store and, and, and vaccine. Yes, and I, those, those could be two different flyways. Then. Venezuela could be one migration pathway for osprey yeah. and, uh, and the other, you could have an Eastern and a Central. Exactly. Um, uh, I guess my last comment is that I think currently osprey are only one species in all continents, although that may be changed. I mean, they, they're the same, considered the same genus and species all over the continents. So I was thinking how it might be interesting to look at the infection uh, yeah. you know, across all continents just as a point of interest. Yes, and, I totally agree. I think yeah. the, the osprey is a, a very good model to understand uh, parasite migration because yeah. we don't know exactly where this osprey went. We don't know if it was Brazil or Venezuela. What we know is the parasite is circulating in Brazil and Venezuela. Yes. And, and the transmission yeah. uh, should be there because that sequence has not been reported before in the United yeah. States. So for yeah. me, it was a surprise when I said, okay, uh, the sequence is only from the South America. So that means yeah. that the um, bird migrate and got the parasite there. Um, 
we don't know now what is happening is uh, that the transmission of this particular uh, parasite could be happen here in the state mm -hmm. because they need the vector. But if the vector is here, then we will see in, in the future that that parasite uh, will be uh, transmitted in the area. But there are almost few paper talking about parasite in Australia. So really, yeah. I, I will say there is very little about Raptor in general. And last question, is, is that particular vector, is that particular vector day feeding or night feeding? Uh, uh, is, um, uh, I don't remember exactly. I need to look for that, honestly. Yeah, I tried to look it up, but I, I couldn't yeah. find it. So Thank depend, you. Depend on the species, they could be, in the late afternoon, another can be uh, late. And also the panels are uh, the height. So mm -hmm. you don't find all the vector on the same uh, mm -hmm. height. So that is another thing that we take in consideration. The panels, the behavior of the raptor, they are exposed to uh, different uh, dignity. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the floor? Juan's got his hand raised. Um, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Maria. Well, great talk. Thank you. I, I was thinking, um, as you note in one of the first slides, this uh, expansion of the grackles. Uh -huh. And I think they are not, uh, they're, I don't know if there's any register of root parasitism from cowbirds on, after this expansion. I know that they may, in other species of grackles, may be host of cowbirds. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there, can, did you find in this group or in any other group of grackle any connection between, or any interaction between the, you know, the, the Chemoparasite you are studying with a with a possible interaction with brood parasites to contributing a, a deeper uh, or a wider expansion. I, I don't know if you get what I'm, what I'm trying to, to ask. Yes, yes. Uh, honestly, there is no research on that. So uh, actually, when I we start the project with Dracker, I didn't found any any parasite reported in Dracker. Actually, the only sequence that was reported uh, at the time was mine from a grackle that died in my swimming pool when I was living in Arizona. <laughs> and, and, and the prevalence has to be very high because only one individual that I cut and I do the diagnostic because I was curious and was positive. Um, but uh, the relation be uh, between these other species, the brown head uh, cover, no, there is nothing. This is a good idea to, to uh, I think we need to start to do more projects uh, looking at the combination of different species that are together uh, in urban and peri-urban areas. And I think uh, grackles, uh, house sparrow, how finches um, and the interaction between them is, is a very interesting topic that opened the possibility for more research. But no, there is nothing about it. Okay, thank you very much. That I know. So, but I, I, I look hard uh, to understand what, what happened in Grackle. And, and actually there are few uh, studies done in Arizona. So it's, it's another thing because all the study that has been uh, done in Arizona is looking at the smear only. And when you look at the smear only, um, if you have a very low parasitemia because the, par the, the host is very tolerant, uh, you miss the parasite. So you, uh, I use an este PCR for all the sample that I have because uh, it's the way to find 
those parasites that are very, very low uh, parasitemia. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. May I ask a question? Of yes. course. <laughs> can, uh, can you get double infection yes. simultaneously? Yeah. Yes. That is something that is very common in wildlife, also in humans. So in the case of bird, uh, it's very interesting because uh, as um, if you're trying to count and uh, summarize in my table, the number doesn't uh, 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 looks great because what happened is uh, an individual can have leucocytosome, hemoproteus, and plasmodium at the same time. So what we do in the lab uh, when we do nested PCR we get only one sequence, but we can look at the electropherogram and see that we have double peaks that indicate that we have misinfection or core infection. Because in addition to that, you can have three different parasites, plasmodium, uh, three species, and also you can have two of hemoproteus. So we really don't know exactly how many species of parasite uh, a bird can have. So we have uh, a, an idea when we clone the mitochondrial genome uh, because we want to have uh, sure that we have only one species in the mitochondrial genome. And we know that is very common and we start to develop a project in next gen in order to see the diversity that is there because it's very, very common uh, the mix infection or co-infections in, in rare lizards and mammals. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Yvonne, great questions. Um, any others from the floor? I should say, online space or something floor seems like a weird word but you know <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> all right well again thank you so much um for your, really, your good talk um and yeah um and then uh yeah so hopefully um if all of you are able to do so please join us for the next afo cafe on 26th of august right matt that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. Next month. Um, yeah. And please register for the AFO conference and look for more details about um, our meeting that we're uh, having with numerous um, organizations in uh, South America, uh, inclu including Nature of Water Cultural Society, uh, right? Yeah. We're the partnering, yes. Um, in Bolivia next year. So we're super looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank I'm going to hang on for a second. Um,